just make those sort of yep. uh, yeah big just screen size a little bit bigger for you there you are <laughs> fantastic thank you very much over to you thank you Great, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon or morning, depending on where you're viewing in from today. I'm glad that everyone could take some time to spend some time with me today. I am from North Carolina in the United States of America and have spent the majority of my career working in Washington, D.C. and New York City. Yes, this is my real accent and SDI did not pay uh, a voiceover for this portion. I do, all, I do often get asked if I am from Australia though. <laughs> Anyhow, I understand that most of you all had just had lunch and I hope that I can wake you up a bit. I know that your time is valuable and these are things that I enjoy doing, talking, <laughs> but you no, know, really uh, talking about transformation and digital transformation and um, I am excited to get started with you and jump right in. So normally I'm used to speaking on a stage where you tell the audience a story about a major business problem that is usually solved through complex AI, RPA, or some other solution. And then I introduce an executive who builds it and we go into a depth about how it will change a specific industry. Uh, however, my home, is my new stage now, and this new normal has come and presented challenges for just about everyone, including me. So um, I am the Director of Development and Partnerships for Aerotech Court based in Washington, DC, and their robotic process automation lead. My focus is the federal healthcare space for the US government. And um, I just wanted to give you a little snapshot about the past year and 15 days for RPA, and it leads up to um, what I'm gonna be discussing today. So a year and 15 days ago, I was living in Manhattan, and it was I was very uncertain about what was about to happen, and everything began to shut down. As I'm sure everyone here knows, it was a slow process across the pond. <laughs> um, I was wrapping up my MBA from George Washington University, in Washington DC and working remotely. And as you can see, I picked up a little sausage dog, his name is Scout, uh, during quarantine in North Carolina. He decided to get his MBA too. A week into the shutdown, I received a phone call from an old client asking me to support these business development initiatives based around RPA. You see, majority of my career, I've worked in the private sector, so I've primarily worked with law firms, banks, CPA firms, wealth management, you name it. RP8 was hot. Yes, it still is. So I left New York City for a couple of weeks, naively thinking, oh, this will be over in a month, as I'm sure many of us did. And I found myself busier than ever, becoming up to speed about RPA and helping this firm identify organizations that needed to utilize a service because there was such a change in the workspace. Um, we first started out with the banks due to the high volume of PPP loans happening. So it made perfect sense. Uh, the number of claims that were being asked upon by the banks and the government was it wound up actually crashing the system. So I'm sure you recall back in April of last year, or maybe not because everybody had a lot going on in their own country respectively, um, there is a big halt with the PPP processing right in between uh, the first and second round of release. So um, what happened was, is in the second week of April 2020, the SBA and Treasury banned the use of RPA to submit PPP loans because the Treasury and the U.S. Small Business Administration stopped accepting Paycheck Protection Program loan applications that were prepared by robotic process automation systems. So the RPA software can, as you all know, and have learned so far today, can perform data entry with greater speed and accuracy than humans. So some of the banks had been using RPA to enter PPP loan applications into the SBA's ETRAN electronic loan system in a PPP lending operation, and the Treasury and the SBA said the use of that burdened the system, and it actually wound up crashing it. So the ETRAN system crashed within minutes of the restart 
um, after being overwhelmed by a flood of applications, including many that didn't get processed during the first round, which ran out of funds um, mid-April of last year. So this has since been almost fixed now, the beginning of this year, um, uh, another organization, which I believe spoke today, they've come on board and they're helping out uh, the SBA and the U.S. Treasury get them up to speed and matching with to be able to meet the needs of what's happening from the private sector so they can work together. So fast forward a few months later, I joined ROTech and began my journey with them um, earlier this year. So I just wanted to paint that snapshot of my experience so far with RPA leading up to right now. And also um, for me personally, I focused a lot of my MBA on management leadership and digital transformation. So managing high functioning global virtual teams and that focus is paid off because a lot of the projects in which I'm becoming involved or involved with um, are helping bring federal agencies up to speed with our private sector in a full operational fashion. So several, a lot of our agencies still operate about 100% manually. Yes, faxes are still a huge deal. And you can't simply cart out a fax machine to your 1,000 plus government workers' homes. So the pandemic and it has lit a flame for agencies to hit the gas pedal on their innovative and strategic plan for the technology goals, which is a great thing. So the agenda here is I'm going to shed light on one project where we have delivered, one of the projects where we have delivered a robot to assist an agency's HR timekeeping records. And then I'm going to dive into examples of how RPA has played a role in various capacities of our federal government procurement lifecycle. And then finally, I'm going to shed light on Accelerate, which is a platform our company built um, utilizing blockchain AI automation. So it's quite fascinating. And it was deployed at HHS. Several of the agencies, what I, uh, the descriptions that I'm going to be using, I'm simply going to say agency A, agency B, or a number allocated without disclosing. So first, to tune you in, I want to show you an example of what it's like sometimes entering a meeting at, with an agency, and you may see this in your own country, um, government, when you're going in to plan out the process of where do you start? What's your life cycle look like? What's the process? Because you really have to know where to begin in order to dive in and start figuring out where a bot could be utilized. Here's a very famous PowerPoint slide by the Army, um, and you can Google this actually. What a headache, right? <laughs> Never do this during the presentation. But it just shows you the complexity of how things are. And if you think about it, a lot of it is done, is done still manually. Let's move on. So federal agency HR use case. In an agency last year um, in the human resources arena, time recording is obviously a very big deal. So this is folks putting their time in a time reporting system, tracking their hours for pay periods. And they use an agency's, another agency's finance center to host all of their information. So it's a great thing for the government to centralize all of those functions. However, access to the data gets a little tough. So as this agency, at this agency, they run a process every pay period where a master timekeeper goes in and checks to make sure people are putting in their time appropriately to make sure they don't have, they don't mess up and their accounting's on time moving forward. So given how the system works, the user logs into the time system. They run the report, pull the report, figure out all the folks who are delinquent on their time cards and align those folks to their organizations. They then send out notifications and remind them to get their information in on time before the books close. As you can imagine, we estimated 26 hours per pay period. This one individual had to spend collecting that information, producing that report, sending out the notifications, not to mention there was some downstream, right? So those people had to receive those emails, go in and talk to folks. 
So we built a robot utilizing UiPath actually um, to perform this function, load the information in an on-demand process. And look, we took an approach that you had to spend 26 hours per pay period on, and while the whole thing runs in less than three minutes, and it's on demand. It can run multiple times a day and week. So the bot runs through the UI time host system, and the robot pulls this report of all the outstanding time cards. The next thing is it takes the files and it puts it on a shared file in a repository in their cloud, and then the robot saves it on their network. It then takes the spreadsheet and filters and organizes it in such a way to be properly loaded into the dashboard. It used to take 26 hours every two weeks, and now it takes less than three minutes of folks doing their time cards. So the bot mimics human functions quickly and leveraging behind the scenes web applications, which allows you to interact much faster. We also automated the reporting process by pushing data to data visualization dashboard so that people and the managers can check the status of their employees' timesheet submission status. Moving on. Next, I'm going to just shed light on some examples of robotic process automation that's happening in the procurement process, and which does touch on um, help desk roles within the federal government sector. One of those efforts focuses on reducing procurement administration, administrative lead time. So we can apply natural language processing and machine learning tools to coach the acquisition community through the acquisition process. Those tools can collect data to identify training needs. The data support management decisions to support better performance through training or process improvements. So for instance, if a program manager is writing a requirement to buy help desk services or tech services, or reading something more complex like the design of a new medication for blood cancers, and the AI and natural language processing tool brings in the clauses and requirements deemed most relevant based on scanning hundreds of thousands of previous contracts, then that program manager has to decide, okay, um, do I need to make minor adjustments to the language or is it okay to move forward? Next is the process automation tools can improve compliance. RPA can do a contract calls review, which is a really big deal. And the test was ran last summer. Um, a bot was created for one agency um, that was able to identify and correct over 10,000 errors for the agency's procurement operations. RPA is also been utilized for the contractor responsibility determination, which verifies if a company is eligible to do the business, to do business with the government before awarding a contract. So the acquisition employee can email the DUNS number to check to the bot, and the bot automatically searches public databases, downloads documents, captures screenshots, and auto-populates auto a responsibility determination document. It also has been used for simplified acquisition thresholds and utilizes well for manual lookup process for pricing. So we can go to public facing pricing sites like the GSA's CALP or the Bureau of Labor and Statistics, which are two examples. Moving forward and due to time, I want to jump over and tell you about Accelerate. Now, this is fascinating. This is what sold me to come on over and join Aerotech. And I hope it fascinates you as well. So it's no secret that the government procurement contracts are complex and the public sector processes, processes are a very special breed. Accelerate is the first ATO blockchain-based program in the U.S. federal government that was greenlit in March 2019. Leveraging hundreds of hours and human-centered design sessions across the federal market, we developed an enterprise-wide solution for modernizing HHS, which is Health and Human Services, procurement lifecycle from acquisition planning to contract closeout. The platform is designed and developed using cutting edge, including artificial intelligence, microservice-based architecture, and a hyperledger fabric-based blockchain 
for improved workforce collaboration, informed decision making, and increased efficiency for federal procurement. So the AI leverages integrated legacy data for relevant historical context, the government cost estimates and evaluation criteria. The microservice-based architecture enhances the user experience through the collaborative automation solutions, and the blockchain delivers secure data as an immutable record ledger for both data integrity and encryption. The legacy system approaches to procurement rely primarily on PRISM, which is a legacy system that's used in a lot of the federal agencies. However, PRISM is a contracting officer solution. So many times the collaboration administration are handled outside the system and the acquisition life cycle extends far beyond just the solicitation. So you have the planning, the clause determination, an evaluation criterion, the award management, closeout, et cetera. This forces the contracting officers to work outside of the prison system, siloed and regulated to emails, Word documents, and Excel. This effort, while mandatory, is frequently tedious and manual. Accelerate response to these challenges with collaboration, integration, and automation. The platform focuses on two main user groups, the program manager and the contracting officer. And the program and contracting offices collaborate in real time for simplified acquisition planning, ensuring a proper handoff for simplified solicitation building. We're wrapping up towards the end, so I'm just going to show you a few samples. So this is the process for Health and Human Services in the U.S., which I can name. Um, so we have the microservices, your acquisition planner, the solicitation builder, our vendor evaluator, and the contract generator. So the benefits are smart collab platform, intelligent access to histor historical data, and so forth. Typically, it takes maybe three to two, three months, two years, it could, for doing, we're running one contract, and this shortens it in, by more than in half. A lot of the processes are automated within um, Accelerate as well. So, and the blockchain, which I have found, um, sometimes when you discuss blockchain, people automatically think of uh, your, the currencies and your your bitcoins etc but uh, the technology of blockchain can very much be utilized um, with securing information and providing a timestamp so it can't go back and be changed um, so this is our the microservices that we laid out for them and as you can see it's built on a data layer um, this is a sample or a screen grab rather of our dashboard within Accelerate. This is a snapshot of the acquisition planning part. It's pretty um, easy to read, easy to use, friendly usability. Um, and it also, you're able to export it out into a PDF. Uh, the crawl's logic section is AI driven. So there is a accuracy rate for the score for the FAR clauses, which is great uh, based on what you are putting into your contract to see if it's close to um, the rules, which is very important and uh, can cause COs their most time can be spent on this part uh, when it comes to their contract work. And it automatically updates, and that is it. I hope I did not speak too fast for you all, but I do look forward to um, being able to hopefully see you all in the future in person, and I hope that you stay well. And please feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn or by email and stay safe. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you SDI. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. We've got a, a few minutes actually before um, we move on. So if anybody has a question um, for Heather, by all means, um, you know, use the console to, to ask that question. Um, yeah, really interesting. I, I mean, I'm, you know, I love all the, um, the stuff around blockchain and, and how how IT and organisations, you know, leverage that. You're right. A lot of people think that it's, I think, still it's around cryptocurrencies and stuff. But the the idea of that sort of um, distributed ledger to uh, mm -hmm. to yeah and 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 to put yourself in a position where um, 
the, the very nature of it is the security. I think it's really cool. I, I'm surprised we're not seeing more people sort of talking like that, you know, perhaps, perhaps, mm -hmm. perhaps, we, perhaps we will maybe. We've got one question um, that's come in from Tom. Let me just see what we've got. Um, let me just move that over actually. It'd be easy for me to read, there we go. How do you make the end users more aware that self-service has uh, more benefits than other channels um, that they use? I'll read that again. How do you make the end user more aware that self-service has more benefits than other channels that, that are in use? We saw earlier, you may have missed it, I know the time zones are totally different. We we saw um, a sort of a, a scale of pref preferred uh, support channels and not a lot has changed over the last, I think, a million years, right? You know, so it, it sort of said, yeah, these are still the preferred channels in this one piece of work that one, that one of the presenters did. Number one was was email. Number two was was uh, the telephone. And number six, languishing at the bottom was was self-service. And we see that as a as a challenge as well, um, you know, getting the adoption rates uh, above 1%, you know. So mm -hmm. what, how, have, how have you sort of um, culturally approached self-service and, and uh, helped people to become more self-serving maybe in that environment? I know it might be slightly different in the federal environment, I'm not sure, but how have you done well, that? Well, um, I don't, I want to make sure I'm answering it as well as I can. I think I'm coming about it from an approach where this is all very new and I don't know if you've heard of the, we've, there's a term here we call the permafrayer, the permafrost layer. And we're, I don't know if you can see me, I'm moving my hands. I can't stop sharing the screen. Um, so there's this bottom, you have this middle layer of ice and you have people on the top and people on the bottom and the people on the bottom are pushing up, trying to you know, show new things that can be done. Then you get a lot of push up from the top. So the middle layer is frozen. You have two different point of view. Sorry, I hope I'm answering this in the right way. I'm trying to give an analogy here. I think it's all about educating your team, educating your staff, but going about it in a way that it's being humanized. I think mm -hmm. so many times that there's been, from what I've seen, when companies, especially uh, tech companies will go into, not necessarily tech so much, but government contracting organizations will go in and speak with the federal government or even in the private sector, you'll see that at law firms. And it scares people because they don't know what it is. They don't know what this means. Um, and it's a lack of being aware. And like the example of blockchain, people were nervous at first about, well, blockchain, well, where's the digital currency come involved? So I think it's educating folks on the processes, the different areas, how it can be improved, the efficiency, the security, and also the fulfillment of the worker, of your employee. I mean, you're gonna be a lot happier if you're not copying pasting for mm -hmm. one little thing like 16 to 17 minutes of your day for like one contract that adds up quickly so I think the whole you know especially since you're working from home now is just educating your team becoming more aware of um, the different areas of how to improve those processes and having those open conversations um, I don't know if that really answered it but no. that's something like one of my classmates I'll give you an example from business school she is one of the smartest people I know um, but she's in an agency and she oversees the acquisition and planning for an agency and I adore her because she has such a strong mindset of making change and transformation mm -hmm. which is really needed right now and in the end from a government standpoint those changes will impact the economy and they'll impact the taxpayers too because why are you going to operate on these old systems Mm. And people are, you know, that goes into a whole other conversation, aren't being trained on new technology either. So you have a big skills gap, which is very, that's a whole other conference, <laughs> a skills uh -huh. gap too. <laughs> so. No, I, I think, yes, I, I think that cultural thing, the shift, I think, certainly depending where, where you are in the UK is very similar. You know, if it's public sector, private sector, if you, the comfort, the, the sort of comf, comfort blanket of having localised, uh, you know, sort of service desk and localised service where somebody can tap on the shoulder and what it means then to, uh, to be in a world now where, where, where it is about sort of self-service really because everybody's working mm -hmm. from home. So I think it is culturally right. I think um, in, certainly in the UK, many organisations are still struggling with that cultural aspect of, of of the of the consumer of IT services buying into these new things that we're trying to say will help, you know. And you mentioned that human centric thing, which I think is really important, you know, putting that yeah, sort of humanity. I, yeah, that human. When I first stuff. started studying um, 
well, the R RPA, or actually a long time ago when it came to machine learning and artificial intelligence, several years ago when I was trying to be more well versed in it, I practiced speaking to my grandmother because I knew if I could not, if my grandmother could not understand what I was talking about, then I was not doing a good job explaining it. So I think it, I put myself in the place to, to practice explaining it to people and my family who had no idea. My grandmother thinks business development is a telemarketer. So, <laughs> so we have to be, so it's being able to explain it to her um, that teaches you how to really speak about it and, and to get it across, I think. Good. Excellent. Well, thank you very much indeed, Heather. Thank you for joining us today. It's been brilliant to, to chat and listen. Absolutely. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll get a chance to do it again soon. So thank you very much for joining us. You're welcome. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, and we're going to move on uh, to our next and final speaker of the day, where we welcome Sarah Lahav, CEO at CISID. And Sarah will be talking about using automation to put your end users at the centre of the service experience and sharing five practical tips to help automate. So, welcome, Sarah. Thank you for joining us today. 